Thank you very much for your coming. This is our IPCS uh, International uh, Degree Program of the Climate Change and Sustainable Development. And Professor Wei is also our faculty uh, of this IPCS. And he is also in the Institute of Oceanologies. And we do encourage this kind of uh, cross-disciplinary uh, training and discussion. And I am uh, uh, Shizhen Chen. And I'm in the Department of the Geography. I'm doing the Human Geography. And we are all interested in about the environmental issues. But the Professor Wei is the more physical one, and I'm more social one. So hope we can have the further interaction. And we do have the lunch, so please do uh, help yourself to have some lunch and enjoy that kind of the knowledgeable uh, seminar. Okay? <laughs> and the topic will be about the oceanology. Uh, recent development and studies, and that was we also introduced uh, Professor uh, Wei's uh, new research, and I hope you can enjoy. It. So we welcome Professor Wei. Uh, okay. Say first, I want to thank Professor Tian to invite me to this uh, wonderful class to talk about what I uh, did for the several uh, past year. So uh, I try to put together. Uh, some of the things I did. Uh, hope, hopefully, it's become an integrated story. So it's about uh, habitat heterogeneity, uh, the energy and the disturbance, how they uh, regulate the deep sea diversity. And I uh, want to try to tell you what may happen in the future. Uh, very difficult, but I try. So uh, the background uh, is a typical muddy sea floor. Uh, I know it doesn't look very exciting. If you are expecting spectacular deep water quarry picture, uh, it's not in this talk I'm going to do. So, uh, give you an outline of what I'm talk about today. Uh, first, I will introduce you several factors that can affect deep sea uh, biodiversity. And then I will talk, tell you the, uh, the effect of the habitat heterogeneity and the energy uh, through some example of my recent work. Uh, one example in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, this is a paper still in revision. So what I tell you today may be changed depending on the reviewers coming. And uh, uh, the second example is uh, the data from Iceland in the North Atlantic. Uh, this is a collaborative work uh, I did with a uh, researcher from the University of Hong Kong and the data were collected by uh, our Icelandic colleague. Uh, the third one is about the physical disturbance, how they affect the biodiversity. And uh, this is done locally uh, of the uh, southwest Taiwan in uh, Daoping, Kenya. It's a Chinese. And uh, this uh, publication is led by my uh, Postdoc, Jian uh, Liao, published last year. Then I will tell you some uh, potential ecological implications related to climate change. This is my recent work. Uh, I'm working on a technical report for the Food and Agriculture Organization, United Nations. Uh, they are interested in how the climate change may affect the deep sea uh, fishery. Uh, so I, I compiled several or climate change scenario for them to evaluate. Okay. So um, the deep sea ecosystem is sort of out of the side and out of mind. I believe nobody, including me, actually really see what I have studied. So to most of people, uh, this is how they think about the deep sea. So this is a cartoon from the Charles Charles Saxon in the New Yorker on the impact of the climate change uh, uh, on the society in the deep sea. So the bunch of people having tea and they think about, uh, I don't know why I don't care about the bottom of the ocean, but I just don't. But hopefully, by the end of this talk, uh, you will think otherwise. <laughs> So I will start it from some early century, uh, early, uh, early history. So in fact, uh, in the early time, marine biologists actually believed 
there's not much in the deep sea. So they generate this azoic hypothesis. Azoic basically means there's lifeless. So there's no life in the deep sea because of it's too cold or this extreme pressure. And uh, uh, there's probably not much worse exploring in the deep ocean. But it, uh, not until the uh, late 19th century, uh, which the challenging expedition that found abundant light throughout the ocean at uh, various uh, depths. And it, uh, not until the late uh, 60s, uh, the famous uh, deep sea ecologist Hessler and Sander uh, found not only there is life, the diversity actually quite high. And they think the deep sea diversity is somewhat comparable to the tropical rainforest and uh, the coral reef ecosystem. So uh, this is, was quite a surprise at the time. So what Hessler and the Sander uh, they collect is called uh, macrofauna. Uh, this macrofauna they are tiny uh, invertebrate animals uh, with the size about a fraction of this uh, the dollar point. Uh, they live deep in the surface few centimeters of the uh, sediment. So uh, for a typical uh, the mud sample, if you collect mud, a scoop of mud uh, from the deep sea, uh, typically you will find high uh, species richness, but low dominance in this sample. The dominance means the relative abundance of the most dominant uh, species uh, in your sample. And uh, you will also find uh, the deep sea sample have high species which means but also high number of the singleton species. Uh, the singleton species means that species only represent by one individual uh, in the sample. Uh, but basically it means typically in the deep sea uh, you will find that abundance is quite even among species and uh, you will find many many rare species with only one individual in your sample. So uh, this coexistence of many rare species uh, has been explained by a uh, hypothesis called the patch dynamic hypothesis. So uh, the patch that including uh, uh, this, I give you several examples of what's called patch. For example, uh, this diagram uh, shows what we call in ocean parallel, a typical biological pump. Uh, which uh, primary production that occur in the surface ocean because of sunlight that feeds a new organic carbon but actually very little that arrive to the seafloor. Uh, so variability in space of time of this transport of organic carbon to the deep sea uh, is a kind of patch. And other patch including uh, just the sinking of these phytoplankton detritus to the seafloor that we accumulate in various of the sediment depression, or just the mount over the burrow of some megafauna animal, the large animal, or a layer feces, or movement, the trail left by this animal, or just the feeding activity of a herd of the large corosaurian. And uh, these special uh, temporal out of sync patches can reduce uh, the competition among the smaller organisms and uh, allow the species coexistence at different successional st stage and the result in high uh, diversity. Now that's the theory. So uh, based on the Hessler and the Sanders data, uh, Rex and the Hector calculate uh, what's called the expected number of species from 50 randomly selected individuals. Uh, basically, uh, you, can, you can think of you take, randomly take 50 specimens out of a sample and uh, to estimate what is the expected number of species from that 50 individuals. Uh, this is just a way to standardize the sampling effort. So uh, they found this, what now is called the uh, unimodal, we see one model, uh, depth diversity relationship. The x axis is depth y-axis is diversity across many, many taxa. 
uh, and uh, along the continental margin and a piece of plain of the North uh, Atlantic. So uh, it is now believed that this pattern called the mid depth diversity maximum, you find the highest diversity peak at intermediate depths is a general phenomenon uh, in the deep sea. And uh, this depth uh, could be a proxy of the productivity. Uh, if you still remember the previous slide about the biological pump, uh, there are very little food arrived at the seafloor. So the deeper depths you go, this food particle has to go through uh, more uh, water color into the food web. So uh, what's left is less and less. So this set uh, actually a proxy of the food. So the deeper you go, the less food you will have. So uh, this increase of the diversity uh, from the shallow uh, to the deep with the decreasing uh, food supply is a uh, uh, basically a relaxation of the competitive distribution between species. So uh, diversity actually increase with the food decrease until a tipping point and past this tipping point further decrease in the food resource uh, will uh, lead to stochastic extinction event and the loss of the species and the uh, diversity. So uh, that's the uh, theory behind the productivity and diversity relationship. But other than productivity, uh, temperature is also considered an uh, important <coughs> uh, factor that regulates the diversity. So there are uh, several uh, review papers that talk about uh, there's uh, also a new model diversity uh, temperature relationship at the global scale. So at the lower temperature range, uh, this relationship is positive uh, because uh, this is because the thermal enhancement that enhances the biodiversity. But at the higher temperature range, uh, there is a negative relationship. Uh, that's because of the physical intolerance of this fauna to the higher end of the, uh, the temperature. So other than uh, this temperature and the productivity, represent the effect of the energy availability on the deep sea diversity. Other important factor uh, people often talk about is the habitat heterogeneity. Uh, it's very easy to, to imagine. So if you have diverse habitat, uh, this diverse habitat will allow more species to coexist in a given area. So more habitat complexity usually will result, result in higher uh, biodiversity. Uh, other important factors including the oxygen availability uh, in the ocean. Uh, in the deep sea, there are often some area that's called the oxygen minimum zone that will interact with the sea flow. So within this core of the oxygen minimum zone, with very little oxygen, usually uh, diversity will be sharply decreased. But just outside this zone, on the edge of this oxygen minimum zone, the diversity will increase. So, uh, but regardless, uh, what we found the depth uh, diversity relationship, the unimodal diversity relationship, uh, still best explained by this uh, productivity diversity hypothesis. However, uh, the productivity can be, uh, the, the depth can be, can mean many things because almost all factors in the ocean are related to depth. So uh, unimodal depth diversity relationship really uh, don't tell us much about what's really control on the diversity pattern. So uh, here I'm going to tell you an example uh, based on analysis from the deep Gulf of Mexico uh, to try to examine the cause of this mid-depth diversity uh, maximum pattern. So uh, if you're not familiar with the Gulf of Mexico, uh, this is a map. And the color of this map is the surface chlorophyll concentration, uh, which represents the amount of biomass, the algae biomass, the algal biomass on the surface. So this amount of food on the surface. And uh, you probably can see there is a gradient. 
there is offshore decrease gradient. There is also east to west uh, decrease uh, gradient. Uh, if we zoom into this uh, area, then you can see uh, this high colloidal plume uh, is come from this river. This is the Mississippi River, the, the world's third largest river. Of course, it exports a lot of the nutrients, uh, which promote the carbon production and the higher surface chlorophyll concentration. And uh, into the uh, offshore, into the north east Gulf of Mexico. So as a result, uh, both the surface primary production, the amount of food on the surface, and the amount of particulate organic carbon that export at the sea floor were much higher in the north east than the northwest of Gulf of Mexico. So uh, we can prove this from uh, actually the uh, the biomass of the basic fauna on the sea floor. So over here, x axis shows the depth, the y axis shows the, uh, the biomass, and this color line represents the biomass in the northwest of Mexico, and all other line is the biomass in the northeast of Mexico. So from here, you can see not only the biomass decrease with depth because there's decreased food supply, there's decrease of export particulate organic carbon flux at the sea floor. There is also a decrease from the northeast to the northwest of the Gulf of Mexico in terms of the basic biomass. So this supports that the uh, northeast Gulf of Mexico actually have higher <coughs> uh, basic uh, sea floor productivity. So uh, with this system, we want to use this system as a natural laboratory uh, to compare the diversity at similar depths, but different productivity between. For example, to compare the northeast to the northwest at the same depth, but different productivity of the influence of the depth related factor uh, to tell you actually what effect on the diversity pattern. So uh, this is our symphony uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. So all this symbol represent a sampling site. So what we use is this is called the uh, box score. This is 50 centimeter by 50 centimeter sampling device to collect. It's like a grab to collect the sediment sample. And we collect top 15 centimeter of the sediment. So this data set uh, contains uh, two time, uh, two time periods. Uh, first, the circle represents the data from the early 2000, and the cross represents the data from the early 80s. And we set, sample seven transects, uh, including this uh, real west transect, the west, a west the central, central transect, and the eastern transect. This all represent the gentle sloping uh, habitat. Uh, with these two additional transects, uh, this is the uh, uh, Mississippi Canyon, just connected to the Mississippi River. Uh, this is the DeSoto Canyon. Uh, if you cannot imagine what is the underwater canyon, uh, you, can, you can imagine this as the Grand Canyon. It's just the size of the canyon, even larger. It is under the sea. And we also sample some special habitat represented by this small circle. Uh, this is the mesoscale basin, uh, just a, a small uh, topographic depression. So we think this habitat, whether it's a canyon or it's a basin, this depression that can funnel and the trail organic matter to enhance the food supply. So we think that the diversity must be different between this habitat and the uh, gentle slope so we analyzed the spatial pattern, uh, mainly based on this 2000s data, and we use these data from the 80s to detect any temporal change. So uh, the reason why we start to get interested in this old data set uh, is because in 2010 uh, there is a a very serious oil spill, called Deepwater Horizon oil spill, occurred in the Gulf of Mexico. 
Uh, this is by far the largest and the deepest offshore oil spill uh, that happened in the ocean. So uh, we'd like to see if this whole data set can be used as the ecological baseline uh, against the past of environmental impact by this large scale oil spill. So typically for us, like, for us to do this kind of study, uh, we will do some observation whether in the field or uh, for the literature. Uh, then we generate some testable hypothesis, then do some analysis to see if, uh, if we can accept or reject our hypothesis. So this is the uh, study objective of this part of analysis. First, uh, we want to see uh, this mid depth diversity maximum pattern can be generalized across different habitats in the northern Gulf of Mexico. That means we were wondering whether this mid depth diversity maximum occurred at different transects that are they all the same. Uh, the second objective we want to tease out the effect of the depth because many many factors that have high correlation with steps we don't really know what factor driving the diversity. So we like to tease out the depth effect by comparing diversity and similar depth but contrasting productivity regime. So we want to prove that actually it is the productivity, not other depth related factors that drive the diversity. Then uh, we want to test several known hypotheses. So uh, what we know hypothesis, we assume that first there is no that diversity maximum pattern. And we assume there's no habitat effect. So whether the basin versus non-basin, Kenya versus non-Kenya, or the northwest versus northeastern uh, slope in the Gulf of Mexico have no effect on the diversity. We also assume there's no uh, temporal effect, uh, different time periods, the same for the all have the same diversity. And uh, we assume there's no effect of productivity, temperature, uh, sediment diversity, uh, or dissolved oxygen on the uh, deep sea diversity. Of course, our uh, usually the goal is to reject all these hypotheses. So, uh, the data analysis, uh, we use this what's called a verified extrapolated yield number to calculate diversity, but uh, you don't need to care about all this detail. So throughout the analysis, we see three different diversity index. Uh, the richness, just the number of the species. And we see exponential channel, that means the diversity of the common species. And the one over six index is the diversity of the dominant species. And all this uh, index or a sample uh, from random, uh, random process. So all these index represent uh, the diversity if we randomly draw 100 individuals for each sample to make a fair comparison. And we also use this linear mixed effect model uh, to test our hypothesis. So the first model, we put uh, this monotonic and the quadratic term of the depth to detect uh, the, uh, the unimodal, or we can say the parabolic, directly parabolic relationship between the depth and the diversity. For the second model, we add time in there to see if there is a time effect on the overall level of the diversity. And the third one, we put in a different environmental factor to see whether the food supply, the temperature, the diversity of the sediment grain size, and the dissolved organic carbon, whether they affect the diversity. Uh, the next, we use another modeling method, method and I'm going to explain why I use this one. But uh, it's a generalized least square model. Uh, this model is used to detect the effect of the habitat, but at the same time, I'm seeing this in depth diversity index one pattern. Right. So, uh, first, I'm going to show you the environment uh, between the doors. Northwest of Mexico. So uh, this first plot is the food supply, which is the export particulate of any carbon flux at the sea floor. 
Uh, the second one is the button temperature of the seafloor. Third one is the dissolved oxygen concentration. Uh, the fourth one is the diversity of the sediment grain size calculated in China diversity. So here you can pretty much see they are not much different except the food supply. The northeast of Mexico, as we just I just told you, have much higher uh, food supply than the northwest of Mexico. And all rest are pretty similar. And the uh, dissolved oxygen all quite high, so they definitely not lack of oxygen. And uh, uh, the sediment grain size diversity quite variable, but still uh, not very different. So uh, here, um, these three panel plots show me the three different diversities. So the first one uh, is the number of the species. The second one is the diversity of the common species. The third one is the diversity of the dominant species and how they change as a function of the depth. So here you can see, uh, it is I, I write, the so the result, the main result is the diversity are significant parabolic function of the depth. So indeed we see uh, this mean depth diversity maximum no matter what kind of index uh, we use. Uh, it's significant. And we do the same analysis for each individual transect from the western uh, real west transect, west transect, west central transect, central transect to different habitats, the Mississippi Canyon, the DeSoto Canyon, and the eastern transect just west of the Florida. And all of them show this unimodal depth diversity relationship. Uh, in terms of the habitat effect on the mid depth diversity uh, maximum pattern, uh, you can see that uh, there is significantly higher diversity in the northeast of Mexico, which is this red line, uh, significantly higher than this blue line. So the overall level of the diversity has to consider this unimodal pattern. Indeed, the northeast of Mexico has higher food supply, and thus the more higher uh, biodiversity in the deep sea. Uh, however, we didn't detect any effect of the basin or the large summary canyon on the diversity. So they are pretty much similar to the sloping environment uh, next to them. In terms of the temporal effect on uh, the mid depth diversity maximum pattern, uh, the red color represents the data from the 2000. And the blue color represents the data from the early 80s. So, after consider this mid depth diversity maximum pattern, there is not much difference between the data diversity in the 80s and the diversity in the 2000s. So, usually uh, we don't like this kind of result because we didn't detect any change. But in this case, it's actually quite good because that means the diversity haven't changed from the 80s to 2000s. So this is a very good baseline uh, for something like the very large scale pollution that happens. So this could be the evidence against any change that may already happen uh, in the system. So uh, this is another result. We, we use uh, this called the model averaging on, the, on our modeling. So uh, basically that means so to do this kind of model, you can have all kinds of combinations, including uh, different kinds of uh, the environment parameter. But we never know uh, what's the correct model. So a good way to do it is just do an average model. We put in all the different combinations and uh, to calculate the average effect. So uh, this is a complex table, but you just uh, need to know that uh, this is number of species, diversity of common species, is diversity of dominant species, and this is a different environment factor, but basically only the export particulate organic carbon plus has significant effect on the diversity. And the both the monotonic turn and the, the, uh, the projected turn shows that there is also uh, 
per, uh, the diversity is also a parabolic function of the food supply. Uh, on the bottom, uh, this is the relative importance. So what's called the relative importance is just the likelihood of the particular uh, parameter that will be included in the model. So here shows that food supply is 100% likelihood in including the model. But for the dissolved oxygen temperature and sediment diversity, the likelihood is much lower. Means they are not as important. So uh, to summarize this part of the result, uh, I modified a conceptual diagram uh, from previous publication by uh, Rex and Hater uh, in the uh, famous book talk about the deep sea diversity. So I substitute uh, their diagram with real value including uh, the species richness, which is this blue line that correspond to the axis on the left. And uh, the total abundance, which is this red line, correspond to the axis on the right. And the amount of food supply as the amount of export particles of any carbon flux. Uh, represented by the axis on the bottom, but this is decreasing. And also, other depths correspond to the axis on the top. So we can see this diagram from the right hand side. Uh, for example, over here, uh, you will see there's about 30 species, also per 500 individual. And uh, uh, this is the current amount of uh, several hundred of the individual animals and uh, supported by about 3 mg carbon per square meter per day of the food supply. Uh, and this place is what we call uh, a piece of plane, uh, which is the flat plane in the deep sea, that like usually somewhere between 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 meter, with very little food supply. So uh, over here, uh, the low density suggests that on a piece of plain that this community is very easy to subject to some kind of stochastic extinction event. So uh, species like this went totally extinct, so that result in uh, low diversity. And, uh, that, and then the diversity starts to accumulate as this population grows and also the food supply increases into a, a intermediate point with the highest diversity. Over here, uh, this is about 10 milligram carbon per square meter per day. And it supports about uh, more than 5,000 individual per square meter. And it supports about uh, 60 species per 100 individual. And the past, uh, this point, diversity starts to decrease because the food supply continues to increase to this point, the food supply may be 80 mg per square meter uh, per day, carbon per square meter per day. And uh, uh, to support uh, more than 10,000 individuals per square meter, there's a high competition among the, all these uh, tiny little fishermen. So uh, the diversity here is lower, around 20 species per 100 individuals. So uh, this shows a classic productive diversity relationship that occurred in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, now I'm going to show you uh, another example uh, from the deep sea Africa around the Iceland water. So uh, the previous example from the Gulf of Mexico shows the uh, overwhelming influence of the productivity on the diversity. Uh, but I'm going to show you this example to show that temperature can be important. Uh, the basic is Arthropod. I believe no one has seen Arthropod before. Uh, it's a tiny little creature in the, in the sediment. Uh, they look like plane. They are bio per station. But uh, you will see they are plane, but if you look closely, you will see a little appendage sticking in their bio shell. So they are shell organism. And this data set contains 122 species uh, from the project of Ice Age. I think that name by the Icelandic marine scientists. And all the assembled collect this, uh, this whole model. So it 
can see that this is the individual segment port. So the same on the same ports connect on the, on the surface segment. Okay, uh, let's uh, first look at the sea floor condition like around Iceland. So this is Iceland, this is Greenland, this is the uh, following island. If we look at the Pacific tree, uh, you can see uh, north of Iceland is a deep water, uh, south of Iceland is also deep water represented by the blue color. And in between uh, this is the Greenland Iceland uh, Ferrell Bridge. This is a, a large underwater bridge, kind of separate uh, this bridge in half, the north, the northeast and the, the, the southwest. And as a result, if we look at the temperature, the bottom of the temperature, the northeast of the ridge is much, much colder than the, uh, the southwest. That's because this ridge blocks the cold water from the Arctic Ocean. So the Nordic, the Nordic Sea, the sea floor typically are very cold. And the North Atlantic proper is much warmer. Uh, if we look at the expo particulate of any carbon flux, uh, the food supply uh, typically, uh, you can see this flux decrease on uh, the steps. Uh, it's highly correlated to uh, the vicinity. Uh, look very similar, just the deeper depths, the lower food supply. And then this one is called the seasonality index. It's the seasonality of the primary production. So uh, in the North Atlantic proper, uh, the seasonality variability in primary production is higher. Uh, in the Nordic Sea, it's relatively stable. So uh, this obviously is a very good place to test whether temperature we can see sharp change the north east to southwest, and the food supply at the trees instead, which one is more important, and then what's their rule. So uh, the study objective of this project is what we like to know does temperature also play a rule in shaping the deep sea biodiversity pattern. And we also want to know uh, if this Greenland, Iceland, uh, Ferro Ridge is a topographic barrier uh, to the deep sea organism, and if there are barrier, how this barrier can affect the biodiversity distribution around the isolated water. So first, let's have a look of the isocarp composition and the diversity. So based on the species abundance data, uh, we can separate the deep sea isocarp around Iceland into three uh, distinct groups. Uh, including uh, the Nordic Sea, over here this red color, uh, represented by this Nordic uh, uh, group. Uh, the, the green color, represented by this northern cluster, over here. And uh, uh, the Atlantic proper, which represented by this black color, uh, showing us this white cluster and also a central transitional cluster along the uh, Greenland, Iceland and Ferro Ridge and also some site along the Icelandic margin as the red color of this red cluster but anyway, these three clusters are very distinct there is no overlap uh, that means their uh, composition is very different and uh, on the uh, this, uh, bottom right hand side, you can see uh, this is the diversity as function of the depth. Uh, this red color shows the sample north of the ridge. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, the red color shows the sample south of the ridge. So south of the ridge, you can see a typical unimodal depth diversity pattern. But the north of the ridge, uh, this is a straight line. This is a negative negative relation between the depth and the diversity. Uh, the second plot, this is the distance to the bridge. So we use this hypothetic line to re represent the location of the bridge and then calculate the, uh, the shortest distance between each point to this line. So you can see there is a negative relationship 
is the diversity. Uh, the northern part of this symphony has much lower diversity than the southern part. The diversity basically decreased toward this direction. Of course, because of this, you can see there's a kind of latitudinal pattern, but this is not caused by latitude. This is just caused by the distance to the ridge. Uh, here we, we did the same model averaging on the regression. So here you can see both the, uh, the food supply as a particular organic carbon flux in the sea flow and the temperature, which is sent by this T, they all have a uh, high likelihood, uh, like higher than 90% of likelihood to be improved in the energy model. And uh, uh, the food supply, the diversity pattern, <coughs> is also a unimodal, uh, because you can see post monotonic turn and protracted turn included in the model. And uh, uh, for the coefficient over here, uh, you can see that the effect of temperature actually much stronger uh, than the food supply in this particular, uh, particular, particular system. Uh, regarding the uh, barrier effect of the reach, uh, we, can, uh, we can detect this barrier effect from, uh, uh, from, uh, from the species distribution pattern. Uh, basically, in terms of the species distribution, there are two different kinds of patterns. Uh, the first pattern is called the species loss. Uh, imagine there is, you have three sampling sites. The site A1, you have species from species 1 to species 12. And uh, as you move to the site A2, uh, the 5 to 12 disappeared. You move to site A3, uh, species 3 and 4 disappeared then that means you have experienced a species loss. And uh, uh, so the species pool a site is a subset of the species which, which site. Then this is called the nestless pattern. So this usually means there is a source to sink dynamic. So the species which site can be the source. And uh, the species pool site can be the sink. Or there's some kind of limitation for their dispersal. So uh, there's experience loss of species in this direction. Uh, another pattern is called the species uh, replacement. So the same, uh, you assemble the three sites. At the first site, you have one, two, six species. And then as you move to the second site, uh, four, five, six being replaced, replaced by the seven, eight, nine. To the third site, seven, eight, nine being replaced by 10, 11, 11 12. Uh, this is a species replacement pattern, also called uh, the turnover. In this condition, the user suggests there is a hard problem, the geographic barrier in the system, or there is an environmental selection of the fauna. Or we can say this is environmental filtering or species solving. So the species uh, with the better fitness will replace the species with not so good fitness. So in fact, we can, uh, we can calculate this uh, mathematically, uh, but I'm not going into detail about all this equation. But uh, I just want to tell you, uh, if we calculate the dissimilarity between the sample, we can separate them. Uh, the total dissimilarity can be separated into the mass component, representing the species which are lost, and the turnover component represent the uh, species replacement then we know their relative contribution. So along the gradient of the depth and the distance uh, to this underwater reach, uh, we can calculate their total dissimilarity along this gradient, which is represented by this uh, red color. As well, we can partition that into the turnover, which is the red color, but the green color, and uh, the next mix component, which is the blue color. And here you can see that turnover pattern is always much more important uh, than the next mix pattern. Uh, but you can see that 
along the depth gradient, the turnover kind of decrease, the lengthening kind of increase. That means the contribution of the species loss increase. So this means that uh, uh, the deep the deep sample may be the subset of the shallow sample. So the shallow sample might be the source and the deep sample might be the sink. Uh, this is quite common uh, that occurred in the deep sea. Uh, if we look at the gradient of the distance to this large underwater reach, then you can see that the turnover, the contribution of turnover increase from the both side uh, to uh, the highest point that near the, the reach. Uh, so this is a very good evidence to suggest that this there is a barrier effect that affect uh, the distribution of this uh, bio hospital. So I'll give you a short summary uh, of these two studies. Uh, first, we found that mid depth diversity maximum, uh, whether it's within or across the transect in the northern Gulf of Mexico. And this mid depth diversity maximum is corresponding to the intermediate level of the food supply, uh, which the food supply is the main driver of the deep sea diversity pattern. And uh, uh, this upper slope the diversity may be limited by the com competitive exclusion because there is too much food for these uh, little organisms to compete for. And uh, a piece of plant diversity, the very deepest uh, diversity, is shaped by the migration and the extinction because there is too little food for them. And uh, we found that higher input of particular organic carbon in the northeast of Mexico and lead to higher diversity to prove there is a productivity diversity relationship and this is independent of any depth related factor. Uh, but the most study shows that uh, the food supply control the diversity uh, but the temperature control can be also uh, evident uh, if we go to a location where there is very sharp uh, temperature gradient like around Icelandic water. Uh, we found that the Greenland Iceland Thorough Ridge influenced oceanography in that uh, north of the ridge much colder than the south and it also blocked the dispersal of this organism and uh, uh, in fact the very low diversity north of the ridge probably because the thermal intolerance is too cold for this isoplast uh, to develop a high diversity uh, assemblage. So uh, I'd like to introduce the next example. Uh, this is our local study. Uh, in the Gulping Submarine Canyon, we want to know how the strong internal tide uh, this gulf in some way may affect the basic community structure. So uh, we are looking at the effect of disturbance on the diversity. So in the background, this is uh, the research vessel, the NTU's research vessel, uh, Ocean Research Fund. So all the assembly will come down on this research vessel. So this study is conducted in the gulf in some way uh, of Southwest Taiwan. You can see this is the general location. And this is the canyon. So the Gulf Summer Canyon started about one kilometer offshore and it's connected to a typical uh, small mountain river called Gulfin River. And this Gulfin River is originated from Mount Jay of the Central Mountain Ridge. Uh, so it originates from about 3,000 meters uh, in elevation. And uh, uh, this Kenya meandered and uh, plunged down to uh, more than 20, uh, 260 kilometers and connected to the northern opening of the Molina Trench at about 3600 meters. So on one hand, uh, this area, uh, the whole catchment area of the Gulfin River is subject to uh, seasonal heavy precipitation. So about 90% of the precipitation in this area are concentrated in the summer. 
So uh, this is a place found to the flooding in the mountain. Of course, the flooding in the mountain will lead to the turbulent current uh, under the sea. That this turbulent current will channel through this area to cause uh, uh, another destruction, which of course there's destruction to this uh, ecological community. And uh, now this area is also tectonic active, very active. So there is often underwater earthquake. So when there is underwater earthquake happen, uh, we cause the sediment slumping within the pit. Uh, also very uh, distressed uh, 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 typical submarine hazard. But on the other hand, uh, this, we know this uh, submarine pit is a major conduit of the organic material. From the terrestrial environment uh, through the Kenya into the deep South China Sea. So, this is a very important conduit. And uh, this transport of organic matter may be very important for the, this deep sea organism because uh, they live in a too primitive environment. It could be a very uh, important subsidy for their food. So, uh, in this system, uh, we've seen that the disturbance by the uh, some mutual hazard and the food supply. Uh, is very important in shaping the basic community in this region. So, other than the, uh, the geohazard, such as the underwater turbidity current or the submarine uh, mudslide, landslide, uh, the dolphin submarine can is also subject to very strong uh, internal tide energy. Uh, internal tide is basically the underwater wave that uh, undulate between uh, the uh, of water with different density. Uh, so you can, this kind of like the wave you see on the surface of the ocean, but this wave underneath the ocean. And over this region, uh, it's been recorded that the amplitude of this wave can be as high as 500 meters or 150 meters. So, uh, and this wave are generated by the tide moving across the steep topography. For example, uh, through the Luzon Strait and the Taiwan Bay, these are the uh, underwater reefs in the Taiwan Bay. When the Thai uh, go back and forth, they need to generate this undulating internal wave. And uh, uh, these two energy will converge at the base of the South in Southern Kenya and generate a button intensified current. And this energy will increase, uh, level actually increase toward the head of the Kenya because of this progressively uh, narrowing channel. So they require stronger energy, strongest energy uh, near the head of the Kenya. So it is estimated that this internal type energy can be three to seven times stronger uh, than the famous Mountain Summer Kenya in central uh, California. And we observe that particle velocity uh, can be 